<laughs> Introducing Christy Wyatt, President and CEO of Absolute Security. How are you? I'm I'm lovely. Thank you for having me. Good stuff. So, Silicon Valley veteran. That's what they say. Yeah. <laughs> After how many years are we are we talking? Uh, I moved to, to Silicon Valley in '96, I think '97 okay. maybe. It's been a while. How many uh, RSAs are we counting? A fair number. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Have you Thank you. We're conference? measuring in decades at this point almost. <laughs> <laughs> Never cold enough. Um, how, like, how's the conference been so far for you? This, this conference has been tremendous, actually. I think that um, we're at such a unique moment in our, just our technology evolution. And I, I realize everybody's talking about AI and we're talking about, I mean, there's, but there's just so many big shifts in our in our industry, regulatory shifts, technology shifts, uh, risk landscape shifts. And so and I have found this RSA particularly just sort of deep yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and interesting and, and innovative. So it's been great. Been, yeah, the, the buzz as well has been insane. Like there's just a really good energy about it. People are so appreciative to be able to have that time to sit down and compare notes and recalibrate as we launch into the next year. So it's uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Nice. You uh, was it Monday? I think you had a fireside chat. We did. Yeah. What was that all about? Uh, we actually had uh, former Attorney General William Barr. Mm -hmm. um, so Bill came in and uh, spoke uh, to a small group of folks. And the topic was really around personal liability for the CISO. So we know that on many CISOs' minds, and security professionals' minds, um, and, and board members' minds coming into this week is really um, this really unsettled sense of concern that the regulatory landscape is really putting a lot of focus on the role. Um, but that role doesn't really have a lot of the same um, maturity of, of the ecosystem around them. You know, if you're a financial expert within an organization, you have audits and you have clear definitions of materiality and you have clear, you know, there's sort of a, a clear uh, ecosystem built and a maturity around the foundation around that. And CISOs are sort of finding themselves thrust into the forefront of these risk conversations at a really critical time, but they don't have that same level of maturity around it. And I think as an organization, we're sort of rallying to to try to bring that together so that, so that we're not discouraging young professionals to go into cyber. I mean, it, it's a, it's, it's a national concern if we don't get the best and brightest minds to continue to come into our industry. It's at the moment as well. So with all my guests, I'd like to take it right back to where it began and how you got into the industry, I guess. A quick one here from Oliver, one of the co-founders of Aspiron Search. Our Cyberbytes podcast showcases the security ecosystem's most exciting companies, but we do much more. Our talent solutions give security vendors the competitive advantage by building high-performing go-to-market and technical teams globally. If you're looking for your next role or need to hire the best talent in this competitive market, then reach out to us directly via our info at email in the show notes. Let's get back to it. All right. Uh, well, uh, you know, I was somewhat of an accidental technologist. Um, I, I didn't start out thinking I was going to be uh, a software developer. I sort of happened upon it um, uh, through a variety of different reasons. I just sort of landed in in the software development uh, programming classes and then just really loved it. I come from a family of builders and, and when it clicked in my mind that this is how you create, this is how you build things, um, it just kind of took off for me. And it, and it didn't hurt that I was... Um, ridiculously competitive and, and massively, um, massively, uh, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to use the word dismissed, but, but I would say, you know, as a woman, I remember in one of my first days of, uh, of uh, classes, one of the, um, the leaders at the school was saying, look around you, this is a really hard program. Half of you will be gone by Christmas. And I felt like, you know, 700 people in the room, 699 sets of eyes all looked at the little blonde girl sitting in the front row. And I went, oh, you think I'm going? Oh, okay. Well, well here we go. <laughs> and so um, I fell in love with it and I found it particularly challenging. And so I started as a software developer in uh, GIS and remote sensing and sort of navigation systems. I worked for a company that was eventually acquired by Inmarsat. Um, I went to Sun Microsystems, and that's actually how we landed in Silicon Valley. So I was working for Sun Microsystems out of their Toronto office, and we were launching this thing called Java. And, um, and so there was a need for more, and I had been particularly working with telecommunications companies, and um, there was a need for more software development, and talent that could, could really communicate between technology and business leaders. And so I, I came down to Silicon Valley for an 18-month 
uh, opportunity and then, I don't know, almost 30 years later, Still there. Here, here, here we are. <laughs> yeah, love it. And then what, where did the directory go after from the time there? Childsoft was amazing. And, and, a, and, a, and a big theme through my career, I think, for technology in particular was really around ecosystems. So the powerful thing about Java for me was this transformational platform that could run on. And, and so it really transformed categories. In my view, I was really focused on telecommunications. You know, communications devices that could run applications was mind blowing at the time. It was really difficult to do before that. Um, and so, you know, JavaSoft, um, I ended up at Palm, if you remember Palm Pilots. Um, I went from Palm to Apple, um, and then eventually to Motorola. And the consistent theme throughout these was, was software platforms. I ended up, I was on the board of the Linux Foundation for a while. Um, you know, at Motorola, we were very focused on the birthing of smartphones. At first, we did many Linux developed phones, and then we were sort of the leader in development, distributing Android and building out that app ecosystem. So kind of bringing communities of powerful technologists together to really sort of change the impact on entire categories was really exciting for me. I would say cyber started for me probably in earnest at Motorola because as a part of all of the different services and things about how you develop software for communications device security, such a huge part of that conversation and delivering mobile devices into enterprise environments became a really large part of that conversation. Um, and so that led me, you know, we ended up building a business unit within Motorola that was very focused on enterprise computing. And uh, when we sold Motorola to Google, I went to a company called uh, Short Stint at Citigroup, went yeah. to a company called Good Technology, which we eventually sold to uh, BlackBerry. I did a small um, stint at an insider threat startup, and then, and then I found Absolute. So. Nice. That's that's my whole life yeah, in, yeah, in, in three minutes. In, in an elevator. <laughs> you still awake? Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, great. What was the pivotal moment for you that I've seen on your LinkedIn, multiple awards, Sierra of the Year, entrepreneur, and all sorts of fun stuff, which is amazing. What was that pivotal moment in your career where you saw, was it a CEO role? When was your first CEO role for you? Um, I don't really, it's not as though uh, I had sort of envisioned that early on in my career. I didn't envision a career in technology early on in my life. So so I think the my trajectory was always more of a learning curve. It was more of a, is there something really interesting to learn here? And is there someone that I can really learn from? And so, so many of the career decisions I made were driven by, there was a really smart person on the other side who I thought, gosh, I could learn so much from that person, or there's a really hard problem to solve. Um, and if we just, you know, tweaked it a little bit, this massive, massively interesting thing could happen. And so that was really always sort of the driver for me. And, and I'd say perhaps the willingness to take on those hard problems and then just the stubbornness to not give up is probably the combination, yeah, yeah. right? Where somebody would say, you know, gosh, there's this really hard thing that we haven't been able to get right yet. Could you take a crack at it? Um, and you'd say, well, that's a, that's a really cool thing. I think I could do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that that looking for learning experiences, I think, has always been the thing that, that kind of gets my attention. And and the aha moment on the other side, I really think that the this is really about having the ability to look at what could be five, ten years from now, but then really breaking that down into the small steps about what needs to be true today in order to get there. Um, and so it's really not different than solving a really big software development or coding problem, right? It's, it's just... A different language. Yeah, talking of learning, like some of the lessons that you have learned, is, is this your third CEO role? Or? I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, were there any like particular lessons that have stood out for you that as you've gone into the next role that you've then thought, I'm not making that mistake? I don't, I don't think we have that much time, but I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember um, talking once about one of the early lessons I learned as a CEO, and this is not unique to being a CEO, I just think it's a leadership lesson, is that um, inherently I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm not the person who's going to, you know, be the center of the party. Um, but you, you, you learned a different level of communication because what I, what I figured out relatively early on is um, it's not what you say, it's what you don't say. You know, if there is white space, people will want to fill in that white space. And um, I was quoted before with a, around a story about when I became CEO of Good. And, you know, we had this kitchen like you do in Silicon Valley with a wall full of snacks. And the, the lady that was managing that for the company was um, changing vendors. And so the snacks were sort of wearing down in the bins. And, and, uh, 
And so instantly there was rumors of layoffs and you had a new CEO and we were cutting back on expenses because clearly we were getting rid of the snacks and so jobs were gonna go next. And I just thought, how did you get there from here? Like that's a, that's a big leap. And so I think um, there's interesting moments like that where you, you have to kind of expand beyond your comfort zone and say, it's not, you know, it may not be in my natural DNA, but it's kind of what's needed. And so, you know, you, you put yourself out there to over communicate where you possibly can. There's always gonna be things you can't say, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's many reflective moments yeah, yeah, along with that. <laughs> probably could buy a book. So in terms of leadership mentions, how how do you create and foster like a great culture in, in your in your company? Um, when I think back on the mentors or role models that I had, um, there certainly were moments where you could have a really honest conversation with people that you trusted and said, you know, I'm trying to accomplish this, how do I get there from here? But if I look at the really steep learning curves, right, it's it's almost always come from a moment where somebody who I liked and respected and admired said, there's this really hard thing and I know you can do it. Um, and so it's not, it, it, you know, those are the moments where, where you sort of step up and say, gosh, it's a little intimidating. And I think, by the way, I don't want to be broadly stereotypical, but I think sometimes for women, it's a little bit more difficult to look at an ambition or, or, or something and say, well, I don't have everything I know required to get there, but I'm pretty sure I can get there. I think, you know, at least myself, I'm more likely to go, well, maybe I'll give myself a little bit more time to learn a little more before I take that leap. And so when, you've had, when you have, you know, folks around you who say, you got this, and I get it's not gonna be perfect, but go for it, um, that kind of gives you the courage. And so I, I, when I think about mentorship within our organizations, you know, for, for many of the folks, it may not feel like mentorship to them. It might feel like uh, gentle or sometimes not so gentle nudging <laughs> where I'm saying, this is what we need to do and I know you can do this, let's go get it done. And I think that people really learn from one another when they're doing stuff together, right? I mean, the the one-on-one -on -one chats are also helpful in a more therapeutic way, but I think that it's, you know, when you, when you get to look back on something, you go, gosh, that was really hard and we really got through it. And we did it together and I learned from you and you learned from me and we sort of grew as a result. I think those are the really powerful moments for for individually, but also for teams, right? That that really is how you build teams, um, vertically as well as horizontally within your organization. That's brilliant. Sam, so what you're up to now then, talk to us about what you're up to Absolute Security. So Absolute is, um, I like to say, it's one of the coolest security companies nobody's ever heard of. Um, I'd like to believe we're changing that. <laughs> Uh, Absolute is, is a company that's been around for, um, for a very long time, almost 30 years, I think 28 years, something like that. Um, they, they, their, their start came from uh, the very first moments in time when we were giving laptops to school children. Pretty healthy market and stealing these very expensive computers at the time and um, deleting the operating system and uh, selling them. And, and uh, probably not by the students, but probably from people stealing backpacks. And so what you needed was a security platform that was built into the product so that you couldn't erase it. And so Absolute started really with that in mind. It's a, it's a tiny piece of technology that gets embedded in the unflashable part of the firmware of laptops for the last you know, decade and a half, probably. So you're talking about a half a billion devices that already have us in. It's all of the amazing partners that you would imagine with Dell and Lenovo and HP and Microsoft and a whole host of folks, um, 28 different manufacturers. And, um, and so that little piece of technology, for the longest time, you know, it doesn't do anything unless a customer purchases a license and activates it. And once they do that, you know, they have the ability to find that device, they can freeze that device, they can wipe that device. But when, when I joined the company five and a half years ago, you know, we, we were in an era where we were adding endpoint security applications to laptops, as an example, just at an increasing pace, right? And we 10x the amount of spend uh, versus you know a decade before. The number of security applications you were putting on these devices was a dozen, maybe more. Um, and what we were starting to see was that some of these applications weren't really working because you would think that you installed it, but the complexity on these devices was getting so significant that it was actually starting you start to see decay. I try to update, update would fail thing would stop calling in. Um, and the more you add, the more complex it's going to be. And so we sort of asked ourselves, what's the hardest problem you could solve from inside the hardware itself? And this concept of self-healing, taking what we did so well, which was survive, fix ourselves, detect when something's not right, and be able to apply that to a bunch of different use cases. So the first use case is, 
you know, healing other security applications. So if you want to set a policy that says CrowdStrike's really important to me, Microsoft's really important to me, Tanium's really important to me, make sure these things never go down. Um, from within the hardware, we're going to monitor them and we're going to make sure that they're they're always up. And if they if they do go down or they get tampered with or removed, we're going to re reconfigure them, even reinstall them if we need to. Um, we've taken that same concept of resilience and sort of broadened it to how do you more resiliently cannot connect to an to an enterprise. So things like zero trust. Um, we're doing some cool stuff now with how do you remotely restore a device. So if you are an organization and five thousand of your users just got hit by ransomware. Um, are you going to tell 5,000 users to box up those devices and ship them back to IT so that we can re-image them and send them a new laptop? Like this, this is why breaches take weeks, if not months, to. Um, but because we can do some very unique things from within the hardware, we can actually, you know, restore it if we need to rebuild that device and, and, and make it safe again, head it back to the user, all remotely, all kind of within a very short period of time. So this concept of, you know, security is not always about finding the bad guy. You, you're buying lots of great technology at this shows and others to find bad guys, prevent bad things from happening. My focus is on making sure that stuff works. Mm. How do you describe the difference between cyber resilience and cyber security? So I was reading the report, I'm really curious on that. I, I actually think they're one and the same. I don't think you can have a cyber security strategy unless you also have a cyber resilience strategy. And so what I mean by that is, you know, so much of our conversation, if you went and walked to the show floor, you're going to hear folks talking about using AI to de detect new threats and to, right, I, I think that a lot of that is really critical and really important and it, and it dominates a lot of the conversation. But if you, if you ask a CISO in a quiet moment, what's the thing you spent the most time worrying about or, or, or put most of your time and energy into, it's the basics, right? I bought the thing that can prevent the bad thing from happening. How do I make sure that thing is working? How do I communicate to my board that that thing is working and that they're protected? How can I ensure that you know that the, the thing that I bought is working on 100% of my devices, not on 75% of my devices? And you think, oh, 75 is pretty good, unless you think that that's one quarter of your organization that is exposed right now at any given moment uh, because some part of their security framework is, is out. So I don't think you can think about one without the other. You know, I think a really telling event is when you look at these big breaches, like the Clorox breach last August, when they spoke publicly about what it was going to take to clean it up, um, you know, they said, oh, this is going to go well into 2024. So that cleanup is not necessarily the, 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 the containing of the bad thing, right? The bad thing is contained. It's gone. It's that you've got thousands of users and devices with data that's not there, with users that can't work. That I mean, that is the thing that has to be, if your tabletop exercises are not, are not going all the way to the end of, this, of the tape where people are working again, you, you, you forgot the biggest bit, right? And so your, your, your CEO or your board's gonna come to you and say, you know, why am I still shut down? It's been three weeks. And you'd be like, bad thing contained. And they'd be like, yeah, but I can't pay people. <laughs> or like, I can't, I can't run the till. Like, that's a bad thing. You're like, oh, yeah, that, okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, the, the report's fast. I'll put it in the show notes, actually. What did, what did you find you. Like, most interesting in the findings? We run this report every year, and so we've, started, we've been doing it for many years now, and, um, and we like to sort of see how things have progressed every year, but then we also like to ask new questions. Mm. And so in terms of the new questions, with so much conversation around AI, and everybody talking about add this new AI module, this new AI, you know, everything has a new AI sidekick, um, the question we asked ourselves is like, how many devices connected to the enterprise actually can run all of this new stuff we're talking about? And so we took kind of the analyst view of what is required to run AI PCs and laid that over top of devices we see connected to enterprise organizations and, and, and found that a shockingly low number, you know, I think it's more than 90% of them are going to need some sort of update or upgrade or replacement. So when people talk about this, massive PC refresh coming or this Windows refresh coming, you know, there is a lot of value on the other side for um, these AI use cases and there's massive productivity implications. There's all sorts of good stuff. There's all sorts of scary stuff, but there's also a lot of cost, right? And, 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 and it's, it's not free, not just in the hardware compute piece, um, but also, you know, we start to look at these business models you know, many of these have a licensing model, which is just a little bit more than what you paid for before. And if you have 10 security applications running or, or 96 
real applications running on your device, a little bit on everything is going to be a lot. And so we're trying to quantify what do we think that piece is going to be. Um, the other sort of interesting question we always ask ourselves, because we do look at it year over year, is what is the overall compliance or resilience of these devices? And that, you know, that is still a really concerning number. So I think we found that 24% of the devices continuously are out of compliance. And so um, we've presented reports in the past where we've looked at it on an app by app basis, where we've said, you know, applications, 100% would mean I installed this application on a million or say a thousand devices. Yeah. Um, and I, I specified what version I wanted that to be and I expect it to be installed and running and functioning. And so that's healthy. Right. Um, out of compliance doesn't mean like if your policy is to stay two versions behind whatever the latest is, I'm not measuring against that. I'm measuring against what you said your your compliance would be. Um, and so if, if an application was monitoring, say, four things, you know, about 24 percent of the time, your devices are, are always sort of shifting in and out of compliance. But on average, it's about 24 percent. Yeah. We've seen applications that have organic resilience rates of like 40, 50 percent. Um, and so. You know, it, it's concerning because it, especially if those users are remote, um, the way to fix it is not always obvious, right? It, it, there's not, you know, there's not really a, it's, yeah. it, oftentimes organizations would say, yes, we tell that user, we need you to come back in to the office in the next couple of weeks and give your device to IT and they'll fix it. But as I said, if, you, if a lot of your users are working hybrid or you're trying to cut down on the number of people that you've got to work with in IT, you know, we really have to think about automation. And that's where the self-healing can really be helpful. Yeah. The third thing um, that we sort of track year on year is, is that tail of, of um, updates getting better. So we've, we've said many years before that um, organizations are slow to kind of you know, push out updates once they've said this is the version, how long does it actually take that version to propagate across the organization? And it's gotten a little bit better, but it's still it's still very bad. 70, 80 yeah. days, something like that. I mean, it's a long time. And, and when I talk to folks, they're usually like, yes, but we have a policy <laughs> that says we should be two versions behind. And I said, yes, and I'm measuring how far behind on that policy you are. So, so, so it, that is the space, right? And, and that is the white space where bad things happen. Um, and it is a really, really hard problem to solve. There are folks who like to say, this is a quality problem. If we just wrote better software, this would, if vendors were more responsible, they would do a better job of this. But if anyone who's written software, you know, you have a test matrix when you're trying to figure out what could possibly go wrong with your software. And so just think about it for a moment. Your user has a device that could have one of 300 different configurations of Windows 10 with patches and configurations. It has you know, a dozen security applications and like 90 other applications, and each one of them has an update and upgrade process. You have an infinite number of network configurations and firewalls and like other things environmentally that could be impacting it. You have the user, like the test matrix is infinite. It's a great problem for AI, by the way, but, but, but for human beings in IT, this is an unsolvable problem. And so you're just not gonna get it right. You should take on AI at the minute. This opportunity, where, where we sit. All of the above. Yeah. One of, one of the most exciting things that I think we'll see coming through, but also one of the most terrifying as well. Um, and as much as we love to talk about um, at this conference and every other conference I've been to for the last six months, right, everything is about AI, we're still very much in the early days, right? I, I think a lot of what we're seeing people talk about is still very early on. Um, so there is lots of really good thinking going on about where to apply it, how to apply it, how to safely apply it, how to how to manage your models um, so that they're not just smart, but also you know obedient and well trained and don't have back doors. And I mean, there's all sorts of things to think about from a from a risk perspective. But the opportunity on the other side is is I think too great for anyone to say that's not relevant to me. Um, so we're yeah. looking, yeah, yeah, but it'll sure, take time. Sure. What what's the what the, what is the future for absolute security? We're very focused on this concept of resilience, right? I think that we um, have been in technology for a while. I think that there are some of the smartest people in technology are working in cybersecurity, and they're doing great work to protect users and companies and countries. And, um, and so, you know, in the place where there's a white space between those good intentions and that stuff actually working, right, there's a unique opportunity for us to be able to, to kind of surface 
um, either through our products or by making our platform available to other partners. You know, one of the other things we do is we make some of that BIOS enablement available to other ISVs that want to have that same self-healing uh, capability on their own independently. And so we really believe that there is this concept of resilience. It's not just sort of a feel good. It is where companies can get faster. It's where they can get more agile. It's where they can improve, improve their overall security posture. And it's an opportunity to actually bring cost down overall. And so um, again, it's, it's, worth, it's worth the time. And the, the, the part that we, you know, it's you already have it. It's already built in the devices you have. You just have to turn it on. And so, so it's a relatively easy step to, to kind of get a dramatic improvement on the other side. So we've thought about application resilience. We've thought about access resilience. Um, what we're showing here at this show is really around device resilience, how do you rebuild and restore and, and when the bad thing happens purely remotely in a very safe way. Um, and we're going to continue sort of building out the definition. Brilliant. One final question. Yes. Like a very inspiring story. For any young female that is listening and thinking, this, but this is this realistic? Like, absolutely it is. What advice would you have given your younger self? Uh, well, it's 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 not an academic question. I have a 27 year old daughter who's gone into technology, and uh, and we have this conversation all the time. <laughs> and I just you know I can you don't let other people define what you're capable of, and it is difficult I think for individuals, not just women, but but I think it is difficult for individuals who are coming in, and they're really in these really steep learning curves to kind of try to think about, you know, can I put myself out there? Do I want to be vulnerable? Do I want to sort of expose myself? And I just think that, you know, so much of, of how our industry works is, is a result of what you can accomplish and what you can build. It's about the results. And so, you know, if you have that appetite for change and you have that passion and you're willing to work hard, don't let anyone convince you that, uh, that, that it's not for you. Love it. Steve, wish you all the best of success. Thank, thank you, you so much for coming on the show. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this very special RSA conference 2024 edition. If you did, then please like, subscribe, and of course, share with your colleagues and friends. If you're a candidate looking for your next role or a hiring manager looking to build out your technical or go-to-market team, then please reach out to me directly on LinkedIn or via our email, info at aspronsearch.com.